Um, I will be introducing our moderator in one moment, but just wanted to um, say a word about the uh, Nuclear Innovation Alliance. Uh, it's a remarkably diverse group of folks who are working towards specific aligned interests. And if you spend much time in Washington, you know that there are 73 organizations writing studies about the deficit, what to do about infrastructure, how to think about, you know, tough issues like uh, energy production, climate change. The study that uh, you're going to hear about today uh, is impactful. It is the only effort out there that's really trying to push public policy. The fact that it was cited in the letter written by the congressman to the secretary, I think, is a demonstration of the consequence of this effort. So we are um, happy to be able to partner with you this morning. With that, let me uh, introduce uh, Ashley Finan, who is the Project Director for Advanced Energy Systems at the Clean Air Task Force and leads CATF's efforts around advanced nuclear. Dr. Finan, I should note, earned her PhD in nuclear science and engineering at MIT, focused on this question of energy innovation, thinking both about nuclear power and broader uh, non-carbon policy options. Um, it's nice to have a moderator who actually knows more than all of our panelists, um, and so with that, I would like to welcome uh, Ashley to take over and start the panel. Great. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here today. And thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting us, um, especially to Carolyn Cooper and Rachel May, who have attended to the details of today's event. Um, to Jason Grimay for providing introductions, and to Congressman Johnson for his remarks that helped kick things off this morning. Um, I want to invite the panelists to come up to the stage, and, and we can begin. You um, sit in order, yeah. Great. So, um, oops, sorry. Um, most of all, I want to thank our distinguished panelists. I'm looking forward to learning from them today and both in their opening remarks and then dur during the discussion period. We're going to start off with brief remarks from each of the panelists and then we'll move on to discussion. So without further delay, let's begin with Dr. Matt Bowen. Um, Matt was a senior, is a senior policy fellow with the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. He was an associate deputy assistant secretary in the Office of Nuclear Energy during the Obama administration and also served as a senior advisor in the Office of Nonproliferation and Arms Control. Dr. Bowen has spent much of the past year doing deep research and analysis of the Part 810 authorization process and how it can be improved. Matt, please go ahead. Okay. All right, hopefully this is gonna work. Perfect, okay. Well, uh, thank you. I'm gonna do a quick introduction to what Part 810 is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I see as sort of the major challenge with Part 810 right now, and then I'm going to conclude with some of the major recommendations from our uh, report. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Part 110 regulations, which deal with the export of materials and equipment. Uh, this is not that. This is dealing with uh, the regulation of nuclear energy technologies, intangible assistance to other countries, and uh, by and large, the Part 810 regulations sort of break down into general authorizations and specific authorizations. So if a given activity is generally authorized, then U.S. companies don't have to ask the U.S. government for permission to carry them out. They just go forward and do it and provide a report afterwards. For activities that require specific authorization, companies have to submit an application, and there's a review, Secretary of Energy then um, either denies or, or approves the, uh, the application. And there are two criteria that largely determine whether commercial activities are going to be generally authorized or require specific <coughs> authorization. First, uh, the countries involved. There is an appendix to Part 810 that just lists countries, and the countries in green um, are those. And nominally, commercial activities in those countries are going to be generally authorized, so U.S. companies don't have to ask for permission. There are some exceptions that I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, the rest of the countries are in yellow, and those uh, countries nominally, uh, companies are going to have to ask uh, permission to carry out commercial activities, though there are some exceptions. 
Those ex exceptions are uh, spelled out in the Part 810 regulations. Essentially, uh, Part 810.7 says that if you're working on enrichment, reprocessing, heavy water, a couple of other more sensitive topics, then it doesn't matter what country you're working with, uh, it's going to require a specific authorization from the Secretary of Energy. Now, on the other side of things, there are a couple of activities that are listed in 810.6 that say, well, even if it does involve foreign nationals from China or Russia, it could be generally authorized. But those are a handful of um, activities. So that was my very quick lightning round on what Part 810 is. Uh, and now that brings us to sort of the, the main challenge, I would say, that we have with Part 810 today. And that is the, the length of time it takes for the US government to give companies an answer, yes or no, uh, to their applications for specific authorization. If I had to pick one chart to kind of tell a story of the last 25 years, it would probably be something along these lines. Uh, as the congressman alluded to, in the 1990s, we were processing uh, these applications for specific authorization on the order of 130 days. And you can see there's been a fairly rapid rise in the amount of processing time uh, taken for these applications. This chart goes to 2014, but uh, some of the data I have for the subsequent years, it's still, it's still on that order. Um, and so you can see it's a, it's a challenging position for US companies if they aren't sure when they're going to get an answer, yes or no. Uh, and the order of magnitude is, say, 400 days. I think this is partially explained by a change in 2005, 2006, which uh, I can't find as sort of publicly documented, explained uh, officially. But uh, there is a change in the secretarial determinations. They uh, currently read, you know, I have determined that this will not be inimical to the interests of the United States uh, based on the assurances that I've received um, in the earlier days before 2005, uh, those determinations were signed out subject to the receipt of assurances. So after DOE did some initial processing of the application, sent it out to the DOE labs for review, uh, they were sent out to the interagency, but the processing uh, at, in the US government continued as the State Department was seeking foreign government assurances of peaceful uses and no retransfers without our consent. So you can kind of see from the diagram, inherently, this process is a bit more efficient. The companies get an answer from the US government at an earlier time, and they're actually able to begin their work at an earlier time. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about deemed exports, because these is, this is one category of, a, of activities where the US government actually doesn't seek foreign government assurances. So this is US companies hiring foreign nationals who may be living in the United States. So a U.S. company may hire uh, a few foreign nationals from India who are living in the United States. And for the data set here, this is uh, approximately 20% of the cases, although some years it's been a higher, higher percentage. And I just want to mention it, one, to point out the uh, uh, review stage times, the sort of initial DOE review, the interagency review, and the final DOE review for both deemed exports and really the rest of the authorizations in Part 810. And, and, and I, I want to highlight deemed exports because to me they're of a more minor nature than uh, you know, the transfer of a complete reactor design or you know, enrichment design information. And that's what gets us to some of the recommendations from, from the report on how we can improve the efficiency of Part 810 application processing. I alluded to deemed exports being an activity that I would say uh, falls under a sort of more minor uh, characteristic. So I've heard fast track authorizations discussed for many years. As part of this report, I wanted to put forward a concrete proposal for how fast tracks could work. Um, there is actually a provision in the Part 810 regulations now, uh, 810.6c, uh, that deals with operational safety where companies submit an application, and there's a relatively short review period, 45 days. 
And that's kind of what I would see this is modeled on. So you have, the, just, just like before, we define the activity and the country list. Here you'd pick, say, deemed exports and then define some countries. Mexico is the country that I've been using. Mexico has light water reactor technology from us. It signed up for the additional protocol with the IAEA. It's a member of the nuclear suppliers group. It's an ally. It's hard to see you know, what, what our concerns might be. But so if a US company submitted an application to a fast track deemed <coughs> export for Mexico, same sort of process. US government would look at it for 45 days, still have the opportunity to say no if something came up in the background checks. But otherwise, I think if you carefully prescribe the activity and countries, you should be able to identify areas that you know, we, we would have the overriding presumption of approval for. Uh, on the other side, so deemed exports don't need government to government assurances uh, for other activities that would. Uh, and my candidate that I've uh, put forward is light water reactor technology. Um, same sort of process, except immediately after the application is submitted, Department of State goes seeking those foreign government assurances. The US government continues to process the application, and the, the company gets an answer in, say, 45 days. Again, Mexico, as an example, they have light water reactor technology from us. So I don't know what. It's hard to conceive of what the, the objection would be. But the US government would still have the chance to say no. Recommendation two is, is kind of borrowing from dual use item licensing that, that commerce does. Uh, there's an executive order there to aid the sort of timely processing of applications. And it clearly delineates these sort of review stages. It establishes bodies to resolve interagency disagreements. Um, and commerce's processing is, is rather fast. It's, I think it's on the average of 22 days um, for each application. Probably 10 applications are arguably more complex. But still, I think uh, having some direction from the White House in terms of saying this is important to get it right and let's, you know, let's have these, these, these time reviews um, you know, uh, done in an efficient manner, and also establishing bodies for disagreements. Uh, I wasn't part of many in-person discussions with the interagency when I was at NNSA. But I, th I did go to some of the dual use item meetings where the interagency sat around the table and had to discuss these applications. And I think Part A10 could, could benefit from some of that. Uh, recommendation three, uh, I mentioned either earlier the switch in 2005, 2006 from a parallel processing structure for Part A10 applications to a serial one. In my mind, there's no reason why we couldn't go back to the previous uh, uh, structure. I just I don't see that there was a non-proliferation gain. Um, I don't see that we added any or, or added or lost any risk. I I really think the the previous uh, structure was far more efficient and had essentially the equal benefits. But at a bare minimum, you could just make sure that the applications were in the Secretary of Energy's office for signature as soon as possible after the government to government assurances are received, and you'd capture most of the benefit from the previous structure. The US Nuclear Regulatory Commission has, uh, um, in its regulations, its Part 110 regulations, it mentions that generic assurances have been provided from certain countries, which allowed them to issue uh, a generic license for certain components to certain countries. Uh, US Department of State actually negotiated with the UAE on a generic assurances template uh, so that there wouldn't be a sort of individual negotiation of these assurances every time. This recommendation is just trying to get at, I, I think there are ways that, in terms of focusing on the assurances step, that we could improve efficiency as well. Um, and finally, uh, recommendation five, there is a section of the Atomic Energy Act, section 161N, that lists eight different sections of the Atomic Energy Act and essentially prohibits delegation of those sections. And that the prohibition for 57B, which is where the Part 810 regulations come out of, that prohibition's been there since 1954. Well, I would argue, and I did argue in the, in the report, that given what uh, Part 810 regulates today, how it operates, it, it doesn't make sense to me for the Secretary of Energy to, to have to sign off on every action under Part 810. And the example I, I'll give, again, getting back to deemed exports, is, is if you had a US company
that wants to hire 10 Indian foreign nationals. For the life of me, I don't see why the Secretary of Energy's attention is needed on that. You do the, the needed background checks, you have some, some interagency review, but I, I cannot see where the Secretary of Energy's attention really adds value. Um, and furthermore, if that authorization were to go forward, this hypothetical case, if a year later the company wants to amend that authorization to add an 11th Indian foreign national, under the current interpretation of DOE, that amendment would need attention from the Secretary of Energy. And that, to me, is doubly ridiculous. Um, and then finally, you know, if the, the, all these authorizations are for fixed periods of time. Uh, so if it were for five years, then when the renewal came up, the current interpretation of the Secretary of Energy's attention is needed for that renewal as well. Uh, I just don't think this is a good use of the Secretary of Energy's time, taxpayer time. Uh, and I think uh, an amendment to the Atomic Energy Act, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm told by lawyers that this is, this is the interpretation at DOE. So if that's the case, I, I just cannot see why Secretary of Energy's attention is needed for all of these. And the new US Nuclear Regulatory Commission actually spells out in their Part 110 regulations, these are the applications that will be reviewed by the NRC commissioners. And most applications are not. So I, there, there's no reason to me why Department of Energy couldn't do the same thing if they were given that flexibility, outline the more major items uh, that the Secretary of Energy's attention would be required for. Okay, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm gonna give each of the other panelists a few minutes to make some remarks and then we'll go on to the discussion. Um, next we have Katie Strangis, who is Senior Policy Advisor for Nuclear Fuel Cycle and Nuclear Regulatory Issues at the National Nuclear Security Administration's Office of Nonproliferation and Arms Control. Ms. Strangis has been an attorney and advisor on nuclear export controls and international nuclear nonproliferation law and policy at the NNSA for 10 years. And we are fortunate to have her here today to share some of her knowledge and her perspective gained from that experience. Katie, if you have any remarks you want to give, then that's fine. Um, if not, I'd welcome you to respond to any of the recommendations that Matt has just made in the presentation, if you have any thoughts on those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Ashley said, I'm Katie Strangis. I'm from the Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Administration. And um, we administer the Part 810 regulations, so I think I'm the one on the hot seat here today. Um, I would like to thank Ashley and Matt for inviting us to be here. I think it's really important to have a presence in these discussions um, because I've, I've seen panels where they're very one-sided, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in. Um, we did... Um, work with Matt on his report and provide some input. Um, I, I won't speak to any of the recommendations individually right now, um, but I will definitely say we, we thought the report was incredibly useful um, and really contributes to what we started when we redid the regulation in 2015, which was a process, process improvement plan. Um, as many of you know, we published a revised version of the regulation in 2015 after two public comment periods. And we found that about half of the comments we got were uh, going to the substance of the rule, but about half were about the process. Um, it was not transparent. People sent in their applications, and it was a dark hole. Um, so we realized that in addition to revising the regulation and updating the regulation, we also needed to update and revise the process. Um, so that's something we started at that time and we're still working on now. Um, and, and the report feeds nicely into that. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, next we have Dr. Matthew Bunn, who is perfect, Professor of the Practice at Harvard Kennedy School and co-principal investigator of the project on managing the atom at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He's an esteemed expert in nuclear theft, terrorism, and proliferation. He's the author or co-author of more than 20 books or major technical reports and over 100 articles in publications ranging from science to the Washington Post. We are glad to have Professor Bunn participating on the panel. He brings an important independent perspective on international policy, nuclear policy, and the measures that are needed to maintain and further global nuclear security. 
Professor Bond. So thanks, Ashley. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, it's really great to be at the Bipartisan Policy Center in a moment in our country where the past tradition of bipartisan cooperation on national security is so uh, undermined uh, in our, our current uh, posture. We've got to work to find ways to work together uh, again, and I think uh, the Nuclear Innovation Alliance certainly is attempting to bring multiple perspectives together uh, to work on these kinds of issues. So nuclear export control is an important part of the global effort to stem the spread of nuclear weapons, but it's only one piece. Uh, and really, Part 10 is only one piece of nuclear export control uh, in a certain sense. Um, and while it is important to make sure those technologies are appropriately controlled in their exports, it is important to do it in a, an efficient way that cooperates with industry. Um, first, uh, it, as Congressman Johnson pointed out, helps the U.S. industry be more competitive if it's done in an efficient way. But secondly, maintaining cooperative relationships between the industry and the government helps get the government the information it needs from industry about what they're seeing in the way of purchase requests, what's going on in the market, and so on. That's actually particularly important, not so much in the nuclear-specific things that Part 810 covers, as in dual-use things where um, uh, covert purchasers for proliferation programs are often uh, claiming some peaceful end use for what's actually intended for, you know, Iran's enrichment program or North Korea's missile program or what have you. Um, and so the, the sort of cooperation and awareness on the industry's part is actually a, a very important part of uh, export controls. And uh, third, it's important in terms of the political legitimacy of export controls around the world, that they not be seen as too much interfering with legitimate civilian uh, commerce. So I, I think it's a, you know, as uh, Ashley and our colleague from NNSA already mentioned, um, NNSA has been pushing to reform, to accelerate, and to make the process more uh, transparent. And I think the recommendations in this uh, report would uh, help in that regard. Um, as I mentioned, it is important to think about this as one piece of a broader picture. My colleagues at the Belfer Center, in cooperation with colleagues at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies at Monterey, actually have a book coming out uh, later this year on the, the broader effort to stem the illicit traffic in nuclear-related uh, technologies, which includes not only export controls, but intelligence, interdiction, sanctions, internal corporate compliance programs, international organizations' uh, efforts, and so on. So uh, look for that uh, uh, later this year. It's important to understand what the proliferation risks are and aren't here. The reality is that light water reactors under international safeguards pose only very, very modest uh, proliferation risks. No country has ever uh, produced a nuclear weapon from material taken from a light water reactor uh, under safeguards. My colleague Nick Miller uh, has a recent article in uh, International Security which argues that uh, it's at least possible that uh, the spread of nuclear energy actually slightly reduces uh, the uh, proliferation risk because, uh, not because there's no uh, contribution potentially to a nuclear weapons program, but because it focuses attention. When a country buys nuclear reactors, as we're seeing, for example, with uh, Saudi Arabia right now, everybody sort of looks and says, why are they doing that? And it, it, it makes it more difficult to have a parallel covert uh, nuclear weapons program. And it also, uh, once you have invested billions in nuclear reactors that are dependent on foreign supply of fuel and, and various services and so on, it makes it a higher cost to then go for in the nuclear weapons direction that would cause all of that to be cut off. And there's an, quite a number of cases where the nuclear industry in particular countries were among those lobbying against a nuclear weapons program for uh, exactly that reason. The technologies you really have to worry about 
are the technologies of the fuel cycle, the enrichment and reprocessing in particular, which are the technologies that allow you to produce nuclear bomb material. But the U.S. policy is we don't export those to countries that don't already have those capabilities. Uh, so all of these things that are being uh, asked for under specific authorizations or general authorizations are not, you know, well, we want to ship an enrichment plant to country X or we want to ship a reprocessing plant. Uh, they're mostly about research and test reactors and, uh, and light water reactor power reactors. Uh, so um, we do have to keep track of these things, but we can do it in an efficient way without really sacrificing and potentially uh, enhancing uh, our uh, nonproliferation uh, objectives. Uh, so I will stop there. Thank you, Matt. Um, and finally, we are pleased to have Alina Toplinski, partner at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman Law Firm, to provide her perspective from years of working with nuclear companies and their international trade. Ms. Toplinski focuses on international nuclear energy matters at Pillsbury and is a nationally recognized expert on Part 810 and Part 110 export regulations and 123 agreements. She represents and advises nuclear owner operators, suppliers, architect engineering companies, foreign governments, government owned organizations, and others regarding complex nuclear transactional and regulatory matters. Alina has global real world experience navigating the past and current export control regime, and I'm looking forward to her <coughs> remarks. Alina. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thanks very much for having me here. Um, I've got the difficult job of representing industry here, um, which is a, a quite a diverse group of people. I would say some of you in this room, uh, many others who are not. Um, as you probably heard from the bio, you know, we will present a variety of companies in the, in the nuclear industry. And uh, for more than a dozen years, I've been working sort of on a day-to-day -day basis with, uh, with Katie and others at, at the DOE to, you know, to get export licenses issued for for all sorts of companies, ranging from reactor vendors to electric utilities to you know, architect engineers to really small consulting companies. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the types of applications and the types of requests we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I would have to say you know, 98, 99% of these are for really, uh, technologies of really low sensitivity. Um, as Matt mentioned, there's a lot of you know, deemed export applications. You know, I was just laughing that for the first time I got to see uh, Rick Perry's signature on, on an authorization. It was for an Indian national you know, who went to school in the U.S., got his Ph.D. in the U.S., working for a U.S. company. Um, that took you know, eight months to be issued. And, um, you know, and, and it, I'm, this is not to, to blame the DOE. It's really, you know, it's really the process is quite unique for Part 810. I think if you look at export control regulations across the world and even here in the U.S., this is a really a one-off where you have uh, a process where every single authorization has to be signed by the Secretary of Energy, and you have five agencies involved. Um, and, you know, DOE ends up being in the hot seat a lot of times because they're the ones that, uh, uh, you know, hold the process. But at the same time, they're just one agency in a five-agency process. So you have a difficult process to start. Um, and I, I think every single one of the proposals that I've outlined, uh, you know, they're really common sense proposals that if implemented would really make this process easier. It would be easier on the DOE, the other agencies involved, it would be easier on industry. And it would allow a lot of this low sensitivity types of exports, uh, you know, to be licensed and for companies to move forward. Uh, that said, I think that the landscape has changed in the past two to three years. Uh, where we've, we've got new requirements that sort of supersede uh, what Part A10 was previously requiring, such as the new NDA requirements for, uh, for China and Russia. And unfortunately today, even if we're able to implement every single one of these proposals, we would still have, um, have a big obstacle for probably 90% of the exports that companies are trying to, uh, to accomplish today, because those are for markets like China um, that are currently blocked by the process. And um, you know, there, there are really big issues here that I think have to be discussed on the highest levels of the U.S. government, uh, where U.S. companies, uh, you know, are, they're trying to compete. And, and these are not just companies trying to sell reactors, as I mentioned. A lot of them are providing consulting services, 
to operating reactors to countries that already have light water technology, they have re advanced reactor technology, they pretty much have everything that we have. Um, these companies currently do not have opportunities in the U.S. nuclear market uh, because unfortunately we're not growing here in the United States and that's you know, another thing for our government to consider. So the only opportunity for these companies to grow is to go outside of the United States and that's actually probably one of the biggest reasons why the, the process has slowed down because uh, uh, you know, Katie and her team are probably getting uh, you know, 10 times more requests these days than they were before because companies not seeing any opportunities in, in the U.S. market are trying to take their expertise, they're, they're trying to export it overseas to markets that actually need that expertise. Um, so lots of, lots of issues to discuss, but I think this is, this is a really important start because uh, if we got a lot of these sort of common sense issues out of the way, we could focus on the, more, on the bigger policy issues and resolve some of those uh, for the benefit of the U.S. nuclear industry. Thank you very much, Alina. I have a few questions to, to ask the panelists, and then I'll open it up for discussion. Um, I, I think it's come up in several of the folks' comments that China, India, and Russia are key destinations. China, India, and Russia are the three countries with which the United States has one, two, three agreements in place, but they're not generally authorized destinations. Um, can, can you talk about some of the reasons that that's the case? And I'd ask Matt and Katie to comment, but also um, Professor Ban and, and Alina, if you have comments on that as well. You're welcome to. Uh, sure, I'll s I can start. Yep. Um, uh, first of all, India has additional requirements under the Hyde Act that would prohibit us from ever making that generally authorized. Um, we have reporting requirements to Congress that were put in place uh, years ago um, in response to the 123 agreement. So that sets the bar a little higher. Um, with regard to China and Russia, um, I think the fact that they're nuclear weapons states and especially now with political considerations and the global situation, I don't think that a good case could be made um, to give those countries general authorization that we wouldn't want to know in advance where the technology was going. Um, Elena mentioned the new NDAA requirements that were put in place uh, in the FY16 NDAA, um, and that involves um, an ODNI, Office of the Director of National Intelligence report for any application for China and Russia. Um, that's provided us with a vast amount of information that we didn't have before. Um, and again, that sets the bar a bit higher um, in that we would need to, we need to know in advance. Yeah, I actually devoted a whole chapter to those three countries because they're each kind of uh, challenging in, in different ways. Uh, Katie mentioned India, and you know, there was also an exemption that had to be worked out in the nuclear suppliers group, which is the multilateral nuclear export control group uh, to allow trade for India since you know, it wasn't allowed previously. Uh, China, we're in this new world where the U.S. government has indicted uh, entities in China. And uh, we had the Allen Ho case. Um, still have concerns about some of the entities in China and their, uh, their trade with Iran, North Korea, uh, some of the cooperation with Pakistan, and then Russia, everything from election interference to invasions of Ukraine and Georgia. So uh, those, those three countries, and of course, you know, Russia is not, is not gonna build US reactor designs. China might, India might. Um, so they're also sort of different markets for U.S. companies, but they're all kind of um, challenging for different reasons. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bunn, if the United States does indeed have a slower export licensing process than other major suppliers, what would you say are the nonproliferation implications of that? Well, candidly, um, clearly it's a disadvantage for U.S. companies, but it's a small disadvantage compared to the other disadvantages they face. Um, the reality is that Russian companies, Chinese companies, uh, a number of other countries' companies are state-owned or state-supported, um, and they have access to very low-cost government financing um, and don't have the same degree of liability concerns that fully private, not state-supported 
companies like ours have. Um, in Russia's case, in addition to all of that, uh, they have a policy of if you buy the reactor from us, we'll take back all the spent fuel and you don't have to have your own uh, nuclear waste repository, which is a fantastic deal uh, from the point of view of, of many uh, countries. And, and, you know, we don't have any offer that remotely competes with that. But we shouldn't obviously be adding on to those disadvantages by uh, a much slower process. And I think particularly for the very early stages of negotiations when the application is for something like you know, I want to be able to show them what my design looks like so that I can talk to them about buying that design. There, I think it's probably going to be particularly problematic um, to have, you know, more than a year's delay uh, in uh, getting approvals for those kinds of things. My impression is that NNSA is moving faster uh, now than they have been uh, in the past. And so I think that's a a step in the right direction. We should give NNSA credit because they have, they've created a, you know, an electronic portal. They've done a variety of things to try to move in the right direction. And I believe Secretary Perry just sent a letter to Congress sort of outlining a number of uh, additional steps that uh, they're already planning to take. I do think in the big picture, uh, a U.S. role in the international markets is important. We have used that role effectively uh, in the past. Um, I think in the future, realistically, there's not going to be a, a huge number of U.S. reactor sales. Uh, in, you know, there'll be maybe a few here and there. Uh, but we will continue to play for some time uh, an important role in services markets uh, and consulting markets. And two of the things where we are known as global leaders are safety and security. Uh, and I think it would actually make sense to think about launching a, uh, a new U.S. initiative that would be essentially a global nuclear safety and security initiative. Um, you know, in, we're now seven years past the Fukushima accident. We have no serious U.S. program to improve nuclear safety around the world. We used to have one decades ago. We don't have one now. It seems bizarre to me after Fukushima that we don't have uh, such a, we have a teeny little effort in the Office of Nuclear Energy at uh, DOE. But it's, you know, there used to be a nuclear safety coordinator at the Department of State and uh, a whole program office at the Department of Energy. None of that exists uh, anymore. And uh, it seems to me that's a mistake because it, a, would contribute to our safety and security goals, but B, would highlight our leadership in those areas where our leadership and actual sales of reactors is going to be limited for some time to come. Thank you. Um, Alina, I'm curious whether you've seen uh, issues that, like the ones that Matt just described at the marketing stage of reactors and being able to communicate with potential customers. Um, and have you also, have you witnessed any U.S. bids that were weakened by the U.S. export control process? And if so, what was it about the process that caused problems? Um, absolutely. Um, I think companies start thinking, you know, thankfully these days, everyone is somewhat aware of, of Part A10 uh, issues. And uh, you know, some might be better, than, you know, better aware than others, but usually companies will come to us when they're first thinking about entering a market and say, okay, we'd like to bid on this. You know, can we do this? And if and if we do, what are the restrictions? Um, so everyone is thinking about this at the marketing stage. And uh, marketing discussions you can definitely have outside of the Part A10 process, but you have to think about the fact that companies are, are spending you know, millions of dollars on these marketing efforts, not just for reactor sales, but for services, entering into joint venture uh, collaborations with foreign companies. Um, they're investing a lot in this process, and it's the uncertainty of can I secure a license down the line? So uh, a lot of companies, for example, are being approached by, by Chinese companies uh, to enter into joint ventures or you know, some sort of working relationships to whether it's to sell reactors or, or services. And, and that's, it's a tough thing because it presents a lot of companies with great opportunities, but there's a, a huge uncertainty about whether you can get a license to do anything with China. So the question is, do you spend you know, millions of dollars and many hours of time in this effort, or do you not? 
Um, and uh, it, that goes through the bidding process as well because uh, it's even more difficult in the bidding process because if you win, usually you have a legal obligation. Um, and if you win and you don't have a license, <laughs> Sometimes you don't have a chance. Uh, you know, we'll we'll write in a clause. Uh, you know, sort of a force majeure clause for for export controls. But uh, it's very difficult for companies to to decide what to do in these situations. And I've seen. I can't, of course, discuss any specific examples, but I've seen concrete examples where companies have chosen either to walk away or to just to change their scope completely uh, because they were not sure they were going to get an export license. Thank you. Um, are there any other? Other comments on that situation? No. Matt, do you have, um, can you talk a little bit more about the fast track authorization pathway and where that would fit in? Would that help address any of the issues that Alina's putting her finger on? Yeah, yeah, and I forgot to mention, so I worked with Katie for maybe four years, uh, DOE and MSA. I learned a ton from her. And uh, you know, one of the motivations to write the report was is when you work in the US government, you don't get to go just say whatever you think. Uh, you don't get to say, oh, I think Congress should amend the Atomic Energy Act, or I think the White House should issue an executive order. So this was... It, it is one of the unpleasant things about working <laughs> in the U.S. government. Yeah. So, uh, so this is an opportunity to sort of, you know, get some things out in the, in the public sphere for, for discussion. Um, as far as the fast track goes, you know, what I was trying to get at is, is you have this sort of bipolar world of specific authorization and general authorization. Um, and you know, to, to use the Mexico example, uh, we we may be headed towards a one two three agreement with Mexico, in which case, nominally Mexico will become a generally authorized destination, and at that point you're not, you know, applying for a specific authorization. So having something in between those poles, the the full specific authorization process and the general authorization, uh, you know, these, these these sorts of fast tracks, I think makes sense in terms of establishing pathways in between as you get closer and closer to you know more cooperation with a country you know you have more and more indications that yes the US government intends to cooperate uh, I, I think that makes sense you know from, from an abstract point of view and I think um, yeah it could it could play a role in, in assisting uh, nuclear commerce Lastly, I think it's a good idea to have a less binary system including in the opposite direction so there are countries that are generally authorized, like you know Egypt, for example. Do we really have no non-proliferation concerns at all about sending nuclear technology to, to Egypt uh, or Brazil? Um, so it, it seems to me that there ought to be more of a spectrum because there are countries where we have 123 agreements where we're also still, you know, a little bit nervous here and there. <laughs> and I'll say, I, you know, some of the, the report was modeled on the NRC Part 110 regulations, which I would say have a sort of greater degree of complexity. You know, they're sort of more risk-informed, and, and I think uh, Party 10 could, could benefit from some of that. One thing I'll say about um, when we redid the regulation and we changed the country list, um, it looked like we were making a lot of new countries require specific authorization, and that's true, but when we actually looked at those destinations, very few of them actually had any involvement with a civil nuclear program. So you had countries that were generally authorized, um, like Fiji and um, Vatican City. I don't think they're <laughs> going to build a reactor anytime soon. Um, there were a few that were impacted, and so we created the mechanism where if we did decide that a country had met our criteria for general authorization, we can easily um, add them to the appendix. And, um, you know, we are, as Matt mentioned, um, potentially have countries coming up that could fall into that category. So we think that's a useful change that we were able to make. Katie, do you see any, um, are you able to comment on the, the pros and cons of the type of fast track authorization pathway that Matt is suggesting? Um, I, I can't speak to official DOE policy, but I can say that we're certainly looking at every recommendation um, in the report and, and from others as well. Um, I can certainly see benefits to some of the, the recommended changes. Um, I agree certainly that there could be um, some cases that would would certainly benefit from fast track, um, and others that I can see perhaps don't 
need to reach the secretary um, for authorization. That's something we're looking at. We're working with our lawyers. Um, I am a lawyer, but I don't give the legal advice anymore, um, which everyone's happy about. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I could definitely see positives to that. And I, I would just add that um, it often seems that we're at odds with industry. But every time I have to call Elena, I have a sinking feeling in my stomach to tell give, if I have bad news to give her. Um, because we certainly appreciate that we want the US nuclear industry to do well. And I, I do see the barriers and impediments. Um, and you know, we do have a, an opportunity in this very um, of anti-regulation administration to, to do what we can um, to improve the process, um, to not create unnecessary barriers. Great, thank you. I um, believe I heard at a hearing recently that DOE is considering returning to the parallel processing structure from before 2006, where authorizations were made pending receipt of government assurances. If, if you're aware of that discussion, can you comment on the process there, the progress? That's certainly one of the things we're looking at. Okay. Um, Again, it has to go through our attorneys, and it has to go through um, the State Department. Um, we are legally required to receive State Department concurrence. So the other agencies that um, are in the regulation are required to consult, but we don't actually need an affirmative yes from them. The State Department, we do, and they give that upon receipt of the government assurances. Um, my understanding is back. Um, in the 90s when this was done, it was just a couple countries and a couple companies. So we were dealing with a much smaller universe. Um, now, when we look at assurances, it's important that, that what we receive from the country matches up with what is in the authorization and what um, we are expecting to get back from them. Sometimes it's not the case. Um, I think that's a concern with um, saying pending receipt of authorization. So it's definitely something we're looking at, and we just have to make sure um, with our interagency partners and lawyers and everything that, that we, we did it the right way. Thank you. And Alina had also mentioned being sensitive to the, the pressures on NNSA. Um, are you seeing, have you seen an increase in the, the workload in this area or, or a decrease in staffing levels that are impacting ability to um, I think Elena, or, or maybe it was Dr. Ben mentioned, in the past couple of years, um, we've had some new challenges come about that uh, were not there when I started doing this. Um, largely the NDAA requirements for China and Russia, and then also Matt mentioned the indictment of Alan Ho and a Chinese company. Um, those two things happening together really created the perfect storm. Um, for China authorizations, and, uh, I, and I don't think that's just uh, with regard to nuclear technology exports. I think it's across the board with exports. Um, so that's definitely been a, a huge challenge recently um, and a huge change. Okay, thank you. Alina, can you talk about China as a market for U.S. companies and any trends that you've seen in the Part 810 space with regards to China? Sure. Um, and China is a huge market for U.S. companies. And it's not just China as a market. It's also what I mentioned earlier, the p potential to work with Chinese companies in third country markets where these company, U.S. companies themselves would not be able to enter those markets, either because they don't have the you know, U.S. government financial support to do so, or they have not been able to get the scope of work to do so. Um, so there's, there's, there's really a, there's a little bit of a linear thinking, I think, about China. People think about China as a competitor, and, and yes, they are. Um, and yes, they would be happy to do everything themselves if they could. But at this point uh, in time, uh, Chinese companies do need help from the United States. They need help both in China improving you know, the efficiency, the safety of operating reactors, assisting with construction of new reactors. They also need U.S. content in their bids for other countries. So the opportunities with China are huge. I would say of what I'm working on, you know, dozens of applications, 90% you know, are China related in one way or another. Um, so it's really it's the biggest market. It will continue to be the big, biggest market for a long time. They're looking at, of course, there are you know, many five-year plans, but you know, something like 
300 gigawatts of nuclear, you know, in the long term, maybe it won't reach that, but, you know, they are on a pretty fast track to build new reactors, and they're also on a fast track to enter new markets. So, um, you know, not being able to do business in China and with Chinese companies is hugely constraining for the U.S. nuclear industry. Um, and I think the DOE currently, uh, you know, sort of has their hands tied behind their back uh, with China. Um, because of the, the issues that Katie mentioned, the NDA, um, the Allen Ho indictment, um, the wider lack of policy on trade with China, it sort of vacillates on a day-to-day -day basis. We love China, we hate China, we're indifferent to China, and that really Nobody's makes it... Indifferent. We're never <laughs> indifferent. <laughs> never indifferent. Well, we forget about it, you know, for the day when we're focused on Russia, let's say. <laughs> the next day, it's back to China. So it, it makes it really difficult, and there's really, I, I think, it, you know, it's, it's much larger than the Part 10 process. It's, you know, it's much larger than we're talking about. There's, there's really a very urgent need to resolve the China issue and, and, and decide what are we going to do. Are we going to just prohibit all U.S. nuclear exports to China, or are we going to try to figure out some pathway we were you know, allaying some of the concerns that the U.S. government have and allowing the U.S. companies to compete. And I can say, probably on behalf of every single one of my clients, companies are happy to comply with whatever conditions, additional restrictions, you know, security measures. You know, I think every company in the U.S. nuclear industry is used to complying with really with restrictive conditions of all sorts in their operations. So if the DOE or, you know, White House comes to us tomorrow and says, you know, you have to implement the following security measures if you're going to do business in China. I am absolutely sure every single company will comply with those. So, you know, industry is willing to be flexible. There just needs to be uh, some sort of policy in China. I want to make it even a little starker. I mean, there's a real danger right now that the U.S. will be out of the reactor construction and design business. Our, you know, Westinghouse, the main vendor, just went bankrupt. Right, uh, and they're still trying to sell reactors internationally. They'll reorganize and reappear, but that's you know we're not in a strong position right now. And if you cut off China as a market for U.S. companies, you can forget about it. The U.S. nuclear industry will stop being in the business of designing and building reactors. Um, I think uh, you know I think that's a, a very realistic possibility of something that may happen unless unless we take some action. The other thing is, you know, there's a tendency in the United States to react when something has already happened and to do a lot of nailing barn doors that are already where the horses have already left. I mean, so the NDAA provisions were in substantial part a response to concerns that the pumps for the AP-1000 could be reverse engineered and used to make Chinese submarines more quieter. Well, but they, they have those pumps now, right? I mean, so, yeah, maybe we ought to look when we're going to send them some really advanced additional technology, but that, that makes sense to me. But for, you know, every little thing that you're going to send that you've already sent some of before, it, to me, the NDA provision is not well structured if you're actually going to have a serious uh, nuclear relationship with China, which I think we have to have. Um, and it's also in our interest with respect to China itself, we have huge interests in making sure those reactors don't blow sky high, making sure there isn't nuclear terrorism there, uh, but also involving them in making sure their export controls are implemented effectively. Uh, so because a lot of the technology that Iran or North Korea have gotten for their nuclear and missile programs over the last 20 years has come either from China or more often through China. It's bought in Europe for some ostensibly peaceful purpose in China, and then it gets rerouted. Uh, and so we have huge stakes in making sure they implement things correctly. And to help with that, we need to have a good nuclear relationship with them in order to be able to work cooperatively uh, on those things. So it's it's a it's a huge deal commercially. It's a huge deal from a non-proliferation and safety and security point of view. We have to have a good relationship with China's nuclear establishment. And, and honestly, on the Russia front, regardless of all of the horrible things Russia is doing and all of the horrible things that they perceive that we're doing, 
it's a danger to both of us that our nuclear establishments are basically not even talking to each other at this point. These are the two largest nuclear establishments in the world. They have the 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world. They have huge stocks of plutonium and highly enriched uranium. And the people involved in that literally are not talking to each other anymore. And that's, that is not good for US interests, or for Russian interests, or for world interests. Right. So, uh, Professor Bunny, you've made a really strong case for engagement in those markets and in those countries. Um, and, and the issues around China and Russia are not just nonproliferation issues. They're weapon states. Um, this is really about the inimicality finding, and it's broader than proliferation. Uh, Matt, one of the lower profile recommendations in your report I think is, is important and is not a heavy lift. Do you want to talk a little bit about the recommendation to do a, a study? Oh, on China? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought really hard on how do we solve the challenges with China, and I, I have to admit that I didn't come up with much. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of the process improvements, you know, would, would help. I mean, it's for every, every authorization. Uh, I, did, I did put in a recommendation, which I didn't mention in this presentation. I sort of deemed it to be a, a smaller recommendation that uh, the offices within DOE, DOE Intelligence, uh, DOE NE, Nuclear Energy, DOE Nonproliferation, work together in terms of thinking comprehensively about trade with, 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 with China. And you know, I, I wouldn't blame DOE if they rolled their eyes uh, a little bit because I know that they have meetings on China all the time. And uh, but uh, that was that was the best I came up with. Uh, the China situation is is complicated, and um, I don't see a, a clear, simple answer. But uh, I, I do think we should be able to clear the way for some of the less sensitive uh, commercial transactions, and so they're not all getting the same length of review, and, and probably that's already true to some degree. But. Well, I'm going to advocate for your idea a little stronger than you have, okay? because I think you're being too modest. I think that getting the, um, the strongest minds on this in a room together and having them share what they're thinking and put down on paper, you know, not, for, not for public release, but put down on paper, um, what the various offices think are important issues around China could really help them develop a policy um, from which they could then address each application uh, from the same baseline. Instead of kind of starting the conversation over every time you have a new application for China, you would have a, a more informed and uniform policy. So I think it's a good recommendation. I do want to open it up for um, discussion. Can I make one yes, of course. So I would okay. just be remiss if I didn't note that in addition to all of the USG concerns and and thoughts on China and other countries, um, one of the major problems we have is our partner governments responding to assurances. Um, and we will have some countries that, um, instead of telling us that they don't support that export, just won't answer. And we'll go back to the company and say, um, you know, have you reached out to your end user? Um, to facilitate this, and they'll say, no, um, we called our congressman to complain about the DOE process, though. Um, so it's really important that all companies are engaging with the end user as well to, to work on that end. Um, I won't mention the country, but we recently granted an authorization where all the pieces came together, um, and that included engagement with the foreign end user um, and, and the interagency all working together. And that authorization, specific authorization, came through in a remarkably short period of time. Um, so the process does work, but, but all the pieces need to be engaged. Can, can you give us an estimate for how fast uh, this, this great example went? Um, it, was, it was very, very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And the, the driving factor, if you can comment on the driving factor, you think it was the receipt of assurances? Um, yeah, I think it was, um, you know, perhaps interest and excitement in a possible new market out there for U.S. exports. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't China or Russia. <laughs> so I think that's a great example that, you know, when people are focused on getting it done and everybody's working together, you can make it happen in a reasonably... Uh, quick time. So the question is, how do we do that more often in a certain sense? Um, uh, 
Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to open it up for questions from the audience. There should be microphones. Great. Good start here. Thank you. Thank you. This is an excellent panel, Matt. I'm glad I've been uh, talking with you. And uh, I think I'm going to make a few comments based on participants' comments. And uh, before I do that, let me just set a stage. I'm KP Lau with the Fraser Energy Consultant. I've been involved in nuclear for 48 years. In 30 years, I've been involved with one way or the other with exporting to China with the Senate Energy Committee and with the Department of Energy and in private enterprises. You know, the problem is we have a lot of uh, recent studies how to revigorate the nuclear energy in the United States. <coughs> you know, the third way did a study which I commented on you. Mr. Bo did not talk about export control. And then Dr. Allmeyer and Dr. Todd Allen recently issued a report with the uh, Academy of Science. And uh, we point out one thing. In order to have a nuclear industry in the United States, like Dr. Bond said, that we got to have a market. And this panel conflict with the BP Energy, CSIS, meeting today, talk about the world energy demand. And last year, BP Energy essentially was saying three quarter of the world market of nuclear going to be in China in the next 20 years. Now, if you and United States are going to continue to have an influence on non-proliferation policies, like Dr. Bond said, if we don't do anything, pretty soon we are not going to be paying attention by anyone. You know, the world dominance of energy in the 30 years observation, it seems to me it's like 30 years ago, we're the only nuclear technology. We're the only kids have the ball. We dictate the rule of the game. Today, we ask them to play our rules. They said, no way, we're going to get a ball in Walmart. Everybody got a ball. The world has changed. And we still have the most advanced R&D. And if we don't do something quickly, we, uh, China is going to overtake us in 20 years in nuclear fleet and technologies. And I also have to say the U.S. policy has not been very even-handed. You know, the reality is the U.S. technology and Chinese EPC can still have a major force in the world, nuclear. For instance, AP-1000, which when we uh, Westinghouse sold AP-1000 to China. He opened up the market for China to adopt NRC regulations, which is far superior than anybody else in safety and the operation of nuclear power plant. And yet, we have a hard time export any engineering or technology support to AP-1000. That's like we sell the car, and yet we don't let them to operate. You know, like Dr. Bond says, the, if we're worried about technology, and yet Terra Power is working with China to design and build traveling wave reactor, and the molten salt reactor China is also building. And the U.S. is sponsoring China, was sponsoring China into Gen 4. And uh, so, we recognize light water reactor has a little to do with the non-proliferation. So my question is the recommendation of this report do enough. We ought to take Dr. Bond's recommendation that if light water reactor technology has very little to do with the proliferation, maybe we should consider if with a one to three agreement and the light water reactor shouldn't subject to the same scrutiny of the A-10. Thank you. Does the panel have any comments on the suggestion that light water reactor technology should not be scrutinized? Uh, so so I, I think it was specifically directed towards China, or is that more generally? <coughs> okay, yeah. 
Yeah, so so KP, we've 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 talked on on this topic before. Uh, the the light water reactor uh, technology transfers to China uh, in the Part A ten space. You know, this is where the the language about inimicality in the Atomic Energy Act comes in, which is broader than just nonproliferation concerns about, you know, will this aid uh, another country's nuclear weapons program? And uh, I think Matt mentioned, you know, there's concerns that were raised uh, on the AP-1000 as far as diversions to uh, naval reactor programs. And uh, I think that's partly where things get hung up in terms of light water reactor cooperation with China. I don't think that would be the case for high temperature gas reactors, for example. Um, and then some of these other concerns about re-exporting uh, U.S. technology to other countries, like Pakistan. So uh, again, I don't have a great answer for, for how we fix that. And, and the way I'd drawn it up, uh, China wasn't on the, the fast track uh, for, for light water reactors. But um, it's, uh, I could imagine, you know, for something like the AP-1000, I could at least imagine a system where you basically, uh, once you decide, okay, I'm going to allow this export of this reactor, then you say, okay, the, the things that are associated with that particular reactor, I'm going to give a sort of general authorization to because I've already got assurances related to that particular reactor project. You could at least imagine doing something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Another question? Um, Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Freebairn. I'm uh, the editor of uh, Platt's Nucleonics Week. And my question is, uh, not to put Katie on, a, on the spot, but the, my understanding is that there was a very quick approval for the A-10 approval uh, process for Saudi Arabia, and it was specifically because of the great deal of interest that there is in the potential tender that the Saudis are operating. This again relates back to LWRs. I'm wondering if, if anyone is aware of of any lessons from the speed with which that process was concluded and whether it can be applied and whether that doesn't suggest that the process itself may not require too many, you know, legislative changes or other changes. I mean, isn't the lesson that the process can work very quickly if people want it to? I can't comment on any particular case. Um, I, I would agree with you, yes, that the process can and does work. Um, but again, that's not just a United States government issue. That also um, relies on prompt um, action on the side of the, the partner government for the assurances. Um, that is definitely the longest time we wait right now. Um, and with regard to China, I think that as of now, and this is just my personal opinion, I think we are always going to want advance notice of U.S. nuclear technology um, going to China. And, um, you know, with regard to nuclear technology, while everyone may have a ball now, I would argue that the United States still has the biggest ball. And we still are the technology that, um, that is the most desired. We have the strongest nonproliferation standards. And uh, I think that's, that's still a valuable um, commodity throughout the world. Can I just ask on the, on the specific, on the getting the country assurances, um, in various documents, DOE says, you know, oh, well, we work closely with countries to try to get them. But exactly how does that work? I mean, I could imagine, you know, sending people over there with the forms and saying, okay, all you need to do is check this box, check this box, <laughs> sign it here, and we'd have the assurances we need. I mean, do we, do we, what process do we have to actually work with them to explain to them exactly what they need to tell us so that it all, so that we don't get, for example, assurances that aren't the assurances we want? It's different for every country, um, and I would defer to the State Department on the specifics of it, but we rely heavily on the embassies to do outreach, um, and generally we have briefed embassy staff before they move into a foreign country. Um, we usually have a Department of Energy staff in the places where we have the biggest uh, nuclear, civil nuclear presence. Matt, could oh, can I ask yeah. a question? Well, let me, let me uh, add something let, real I quick, quick here. Matt, uh, I'll, I'll say in the, in the historical record, there are these sort of odd uh, cases where it looks like 
Part A-10 authorizations have gone through in a remarkably short amount of time. I mean, like 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. And I see those, and I'm like, what exactly was happening there? But uh, I do think, uh, again, having worked in the government, if the Secretary of Energy's attention is focused, you know, like a spotlight, like the eye of Sauron, you know, focused on, <laughs> you know, nobody wants to have the eye on them, so the, the, the authorizations move off of desks very quickly. Um, but I, I think it's, it's hard to expect that's going to be the case for all uh, of the Part 810 authorizations that come through. Matt, you, you, one of your recommendations was that the State Department um, seek assurances preemptively, essentially. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? And then could you also speak to um, what you found about the role of foreign government assurances in the processing time? Sure. And the data you have access to? Sure. So, uh, you know, my experience with government assurances, there were two folks that I knew in the U.S. government. Robin Delabar, a legend over at U.S. Department of State, and then uh, Jessica Norlis at DOE. And, and both of them were responsible for reaching out to embassies um, in other countries saying, hey, you know, we have this, this application. And, and they, they actually worked on both the Part 110 uh, cases and the Part 810 cases. And it, it's my understanding in some cases they'd even um, switch them up depending upon if they knew people better in, in, in different embassies. But uh, that was, you know, that that was my experience is, is you know, when the applications go over to, to state, I mean, Robin will reach out and, uh, you know, the, the, the analysis that we put on the website this weekend uh, was based on data that uh, had been supplied to GAO for their 2014 study and included about 90 specific authorizations. And what we wanted to do was is get at how much do the, the foreign government assurances take up of the time, of the total time it takes for processing these, these part of 810 applications. It's just, it's hard to get at that data, but, but that particular data set that was supplied to GAO had a large enough sample you could look at what's the Department of State's response time. So when does the Department of State get the application? When do they respond, provide their concurrence? Because the amount of time for government-to-government -government assurance is included inside of that. So you could kind of use that as a proxy for how much, um, uh, how much time of the total application processing time is taken up by foreign government assurances. So we saw this all over the map. You had uh, authorizations that went through in a rel relatively short amount of time, you know, 150, 200 days, all the way out to 700, 800 days. And in both cases, you had where the assurances were taking up a very small amount of time or a very large amount of time. So there was no clear pattern that we saw which you know, to me said there's a, there's a fair amount of variance in the amount of time the U.S. government is taking to process these applications, which to me says, okay, there's, there's, there's room for improvement in the system in the U.S. government independent of the foreign government assurances. But that one recommendation was, was focused on, you know, what could we do proactively to try and reduce the amount of time for foreign government assurances. Great, thank you. Well, we are about out of time, so I want to thank again the BPC for hosting this. Um, thank the audience for your attention and your, your comments and questions. Um, this is a really important topic. I think there's been a useful exchange of ideas that we can move forward with to try to improve the efficiency of the process. I want to highlight um, on Wednesday this week, Pillsbury is hosting the ninth annual Pillsbury NEI seminar on hot button issues in international nuclear trade. That'll cover part 810 as well as other issues in international nuclear trade, um, which we started to talk about a little bit today. And I think it's, it's all going to be a really um, important conversation over the coming months and coming years. And I'm just going to um, take moderator's privilege here to take a few moments uh, for my own commentary. Um, I, I wanted to say that it's a harsh reality of business that if we are last to market, we're likely to become irrelevant. And it's a harsh reality of global nuclear security that it's the countries most active in nuclear trade that have the greatest influence on global nuclear safety, security, and nonproliferation standards. The United States must be a leader in this area. And we've seen that when the, the eye is on the topic, um, this process can move quickly. But we can't require that every time. Um, we need to get our policies aligned towards a, a more efficient process so that it doesn't require um, an enormous amount of attention from the highest levels. So I want to um, thank you all very much. And, and please join me in thanking our <coughs> panelists for the great discussion.